So the first thing that's coming around are little cards. <clears throat> I use those, they're called, I call them cheat sheets. It's basically just like, here's how you should organize stuff, name stuff. Um, when we make movies, these are the settings. When we make still images, these are the settings. It should make your job a lot easier if you use those. <clears throat> I want to take as much of the repetitive guesswork out of this as possible. So anytime we do a movie, it's always going to be at the same exact settings. Anytime we do a still, it's always going to be at the same exact settings. Okay? That way, there's no guessing. You know what's due, a still, what size is a still, this or that. right? Um, so keep those with you at all times. <clears throat> we'll be utilizing that. Um, there we, go. Uh, we also have a terminology sheet that went around. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to go through um, in a class lecture all of these specific things. I will have a separate lecture that I just throw on Canvas that you can watch if you want to watch it. If you don't want to watch it, then don't watch it. Regardless of whether you do or not, we will have a test on these things, and all of these things will be um, utilized throughout the class. The more information you know about these, the easier it's going to be to understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how it's done. Okay? So just keep that with you. Definitely read through it. If you're not sure what something is that I say, then you can say, oh, Maya, that's a different software for creating realistic 3D assets. Or uh, that's what a null is. Or that's what uh, a quad is. You know, it keeps saying quads all the time. And then obviously you have your um, hotkey sheet. Oh, apparently I didn't have it as a PDF. Uh, the hotkey sheet will list all the hotkeys that we need. <clears throat> Same kind of thing. I'm going to go through hotkeys as we need them in the software. Uh, but as we uh, progress throughout the semester, we'll be seeing more and more of these. I'm not going to hit them all with you right at once, but I will have a video on Canvas at some point that will show you here's what each one of these things will do. <clears throat> Does anyone in here not use hotkeys? Does anyone in here use hotkeys? Good. OK. Uh, better than my After Effects class, those guys. <laughs> Um, hotkeys are essential. You need to be able to work quickly, so the faster you can get something done, then you can do it over and over and over again and make it better and better and better. Um, that's what we want to do. All of these hotkeys are typically hotkeys that uh, beginners will use. As you get more advanced, there will be more hotkeys. There's not a definitive list of these are the only ones you need. These are the starting point of the ones that you should be using and should use. Okay. So definitely keep that by you every single day while you're working so you can um, use that. Cool. All right. Uh, if your computer is not on, turn your computer on. <clears throat> Has anyone here never used a PC before? Cool. Um, just some information about the computers. <clears throat> the college computers in this room and in all the other rooms, you can't write to certain areas or you can write to them. But when the computer reboots, that information is gone. Okay, So in this room, it's on the C drive. If you save anything to the C drive, the desktop, documents, downloads, any of that stuff, when the computer reboots, it's gone. Okay, um, You have on your computer a P drive. That's where students can save stuff. And if the computer reboots, it's not gone. However, just like I talked about on uh, Monday, if someone goes in there and just deletes stuff, obviously it's gone. Okay, It's not protected. Um, so you always want to back your stuff up. So on my laptop, I don't have a P drive. So I'm going to pretend um, I have a P drive by going into this folder that I named P drive. Okay? So I want you to go into your P drive on your computer. Apart from the regular cinema hotkeys that we're using, <clears throat> I'm also going to talk about Windows hotkeys, because I think hotkeys across any platform are important to know. Um, when you go into your computer, this is typically what people do. They click on this. <clears throat> they click on, I don't even know what to click on here, because I don't use it. <laughs> they click on something, and then they get to this area, and then they find their stuff. Okay. The hotkey for getting right to your window is just window E. If you hit that, it just jumps open that window, and then there it is. Your stuff's right there. Okay. Uh, one of the reasons I love PCs is because I can navigate pretty much the entire interface without using a mouse. I can use hotkeys for the keyboard, for menus, for everything. On a Mac, it's very difficult to do that. Okay, 
so I want you to create um, a folder structure for all of your stuff. <clears throat> so make a folder on the P drive, and you're going to call it your last name underscore W19. <clears throat> uh, go to this PC. And then you should see P drive. No. Right there, yep. Oh, I'm already in it. Yeah, you're already in it. Oh, okay. okay. Under a computer there. You have to open up that thing and then P drive. Yep. And then just make that folder structure of your last name underscore W19. <clears throat> and then inside that folder, make another folder, your last name underscore W19 underscore And then inside that folder, make another folder, <clears throat> your last name underscore project. And then inside that folder, use your cheat sheet there's all the other folders you should have on there. <clears throat> and make sure you spell them correctly. Uh, so we have our last name uh, underscore W19, our last name underscore W19 underscore 2510, and then inside of that we have our project folder. Hmm, I forgot to make a project folder. <laughs> there you go. And inside that we have final references, renders, scenes, and textures. So as 3D works a bit differently than um, other softwares, <clears throat> I'm going to go through what each one of these things mean. So some of these you'll know. So what do you think goes in the references folder? References, right? <clears throat> so if we go out and we are going to be modeling a chair, it helps to get images of chairs that we could then use to help us figure out what we want it to look like. Same thing with desks and lamps and people and whatever else. <clears throat> so any references we find on the internet or draw or whatever, typically I like to keep them in that folder. Uh, what about textures? Correct. Textures, right? So if we have a desk and we want it to look like wood, we need to get a picture of wood, put that in our textures folder, and then that's where we pull these images from. As a 3D person, the more stuff that... Um, you want to create or emulate of real world items, typically you're going to create a texture library of things. One of the biggest resources that we use uh, for textures is textures.com. These are free textures. Um, you can pay for it if you want the high res ones. For this class, you don't need the high res ones. Um, if this was production, you definitely want the high res ones. If I had a picture of <clears throat> a rock, and it's low res, and I put it up on IMAX screen, it's going to look horrible. <clears throat> but on these screens, it's fine, right? Um, 
So if I go to uh, here and I type in, let's say, wood, <coughs> these are all the different wood textures that I could download. So depending on what kind of uh, wood I'm trying to emulate, they have textures for all of these kinds of things. Um, some of these are substance textures, which is why we see the S right there. Substance is a separate thing that um, in the later classes we get into. <clears throat> these down here are actual like textures that you could use on a floor, on a piece of wood, on a sculpture, or whatever. Here's more textures again. Um, someone's job at some companies is actually to create these things. So literally they go out there and they take pictures of different pieces of wood and then they bring it back into Photoshop and they clean it up and make sure it looks good and uh, utilize it. Okay, so that's uh, texture.com and here's another one like if you look at metal. You'd be surprised at all the different <clears throat> kinds of metal that there are, different uh, surfaces you're trying to emulate. Now, is it rusty? Is it uh, patterned? Is it crimped? Are these little uh, bumps on it? Right? So there's all these different kinds of things. And every single one of those is typically something you would use inside of the software. So that's what textures would have, is anything that we would download that we we're going to use on an item, <clears throat> we would throw inside the textures folder. Uh, scenes is going to be where our, after, where our cinema file goes. Okay, So our cinema project is not called a file. It's called a scene. So our scene is everything that's inside there. And the reason we call it that is because when we work in 3D, we're not working on a single image. We're working on an environment. We're working on building something. If we were going to build this room, if you're going to go in Photoshop and draw the room, <clears throat> you might look around, try to find a good angle, get a picture of it, and that's what you would use. In the scene, you're actually building the table, the chairs, the computers, the wires, the keyboards, the desks, every single thing you would see in this room, you're building. And so that's why they call it a scene uh, in 3D. Okay. Uh, and then we have renders. <clears throat> Anything that we take out of cinema is typically going to be a rendered image. So once we've built this room inside of our scene, <clears throat> I may move my, my virtual camera around and take a picture of it from a certain angle and render it out. And that image would go into my renders folder. If I have an animation where I have, instead of a camera just being in one spot, I have a camera kind of like circling around the room, every single one of those frames gets rendered out and saved into that renders folder. Okay? So if we had... <clears throat> Um, 120 frames, how many files would I get for that? 120, right? 120 frames, 120 files. Um, and how many seconds is that if it's 30 frames a second? Four, right? So four seconds is 120 frames. That's a lot of information for four seconds, right? Uh, so just think about Pixar and all those because they have hours of stuff. And their stuff is broken up into layers and layers and layers. It's insane. Uh, and then final is where you're going to turn in your, this is like your, your final stuff. You take those frames, you put it in After Effects, and you make a movie, that goes in final. You take your still image, you bring it in Photoshop, touch it up some, that goes into your final. Okay, so when I go to grade, <clears throat> I jump into your final, I look at your end products, I jump into scene, I open up your last scene file, and I'm able to look at all the stuff that you created. Okay, everything else is basically just as you're working kind of thing. <clears throat> cool. So uh, we have our project set up. Every project that we do is going to have that same format to it. Project, all those folders. <clears throat> I'm going to let you decide, do you want to recreate that same folder structure every time, or do you want to copy this one and paste it and just rename the project folder? Just copy and paste it, right? <laughs> so go back to your project and just copy and paste it and just change it instead of your last name project, just type <clears throat> your last name playing. <clears throat> it is. <laughs> yep. Well, even on Windows, it used to be you could hit enter and change names of stuff. You can't do that anymore because it now goes in the folder. It's weird. Yep. 
I got a new keyboard at home. Cool. All right, so now we have two project folders, project and playing. Every time we start a new project, <clears throat> we're going to come back here, grab the project folder, copy and paste it, rename it, and start our stuff and save our stuff into that one. Okay? Don't save anything into project. That's just for us to copy it and paste it. All right, so now we can go into cinema. Um, you can do this the annoying way, which is um, move your mouse all the way down to the bottom left and click on here, and then scroll through this until you find cinema. Or you can just click the Windows key on your keyboard and just start typing cinema. <clears throat> I did find out that um, it looks like cinema 19 is not available to download. Okay, um, I, Last semester it was, 19 and 20 were there, now it's not. So <clears throat> I'm going to try to get um, 20 in here, so by next week hopefully that will be all set up. Okay. So if you download at home, which I recommend, download 20. Yep. Cool. Um, you just get that pop-up box every time. So I'm going to work in 20 for today because I can't get 19 on this one anymore. So um, it's, everything is the same as far as what we're doing. That hasn't changed from 19 to 20. Um, none of that will be like crazy. Uh, you may get two pop-ups. One of them is going to say there's updates available. Just close the update box. The other one is going to be something about a survey. Uh, I'll let you decide if you want to take a survey or submit your stuff. Okay. <clears throat> I'm living off of these cough drops, these throat drops for the past like week. They're awesome. I think I'm addicted now. <clears throat> um, cool. So uh, 3D interfaces, again, it's completely different than anything that um, you've worked on before, typically, unless you've worked in 3D, because what we see is not the end result, okay? We are working on pieces that will then be pushed into an end result, right? We build a table leg, like you actually build a table leg, you build the table top, you put those things together, you give it the color of wood, you give it lights, you put a camera in there, and then you hit render, and then hopefully it looks like a table, okay? Um, so it's different. So the interface is obviously a bit different as well. So let's start at the top. <clears throat> the very, very top of the screen is just your menu bar, okay? Depending on what you're doing in the software is which area you will be in. Typically, um, you can avoid most of the menu bar at the top. There's some things that I use on it, but most of them I can get through a hotkey or get through um, through the next area, which is down here. Okay, so all these things in the far right um, exist also up here. Okay, so if I go to create object, here's a bunch of objects, or if I go to this, there's a bunch of objects too. Okay, so however you want to access things is how you, know, you can get to it through that. All right, some things over here are not listed over there. Okay, like this one says uh, generators. Or not generators. Uh, where was the one? Field. Okay, so there's no field over here that only exists there, but I rarely would use something like field. Okay, um, but just be aware that these things are also up here. These are our render buttons, which we'll get to. These are the directions that we can move stuff. These are our our main tools. So when you're working in Photoshop, <clears throat> if you wanted to move something, you would switch to which tool? Yeah, move tool, selection tool, arrow tool, whatever you call it. <clears throat> you grab it and move it. And then you want to rotate it, what would you grab? Right, R, rotate, free transform, I'll do both of those, right? Even scaling, you can do inside that. <clears throat> In 3D, each one of those is a separate tool. If I want to move something, that's a tool. Rotate, that's a tool. Scale, that's a tool. Okay? So each one of these up here, move, rotate, and scale. Or Sorry, move, scale, and rotate. Uh, those three are the tools right there. <clears throat> it's nice they have the hotkeys right there too. They're on your sheet, obviously. But again, get used to using those hotkeys. Um, and then this is live selection. <clears throat> um, when you select things, we are not just selecting um, objects. Sometimes we're selecting components of it. So think about you drew a gradient mesh in Illustrator. You may want to grab the whole gradient mesh and move it over, or you may want to grab the individual points of the gradient mesh and move those around, okay? Same kind of thing. You may grab an object or its components. And this is kind of like, you know, how you select stuff is right there. 
Um, these are different modes of what we can select and move around, which we'll see. Um, this down here is where we'll have materials. This is our timeline. Um, this is our project settings, and these are our objects. It's very arbitrary right now because we don't have anything in the scene. So let's create something in the scene and then see how it works. So <clears throat> under your object menu, pick something inside here besides null, relief, or guide. <clears throat> anything else you can pick. Okay. <laughs> That's our person. My, in, I click the person that you can have whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Um, so there he is. So now we've actually populated and changed some of our menus. <clears throat> Once he got created, over here on the right, it says figure. Every single one of our objects is listed right over in, in that window. Okay. Um, this is not a layer like Photoshop or Illustrator. This is just an object. Layers are a separate thing. Okay. So just be aware of that is different. Um, if you switch to your move tool, what's the hotkey for move tool? W. Yep. Oh, wait, sorry, E. Nope. <laughs> I'm in the wrong software. Um, <clears throat> Maya is W. Uh, yeah, E. Uh, so E is the move tool. And then you can click on the arrows and move the character around. How many arrows are, are there? Three. Yep. Uh, what do you think they mean? <clears throat> X, Y, and Z. And After Effects class, right? What are the colors? So X, Y, Z, R, G, B. It's an easy way to remember that. Um, that translates into After Effects. That translates into Maya. Every 3D software uses that same color combination. Okay. So if you know it in one, you'll know it in another one. <clears throat> so X is the red one, Y is the green, and then blue is the Z. It matters in this software because um, Photoshop doesn't save like where the position of an object is. You move it, and it's just kind of like, okay, it's there. Here, it actually is like, OK, it's at this coordinate system. Because when you animate, it's all about animating a coordinate system moving around. <clears throat> so that's what those things are for. If you wanted to rotate, what would you hit? R. OK, and then you can rotate. And again, you'll see red, green, blue again. Same thing, right? So it's, we still have that x, y, and z. OK, and then what about scale? T. And then you'll notice on your item, <clears throat> as you click and drag to scale it, it doesn't scale disproportionate right now, right? As you scale any one of those values, it's scaling all three of them at the same time. Uh, right now, it's locked into this kind of uh, proportionate mode. Um, and that's what it's doing. Um, did anyone notice a pattern with those three hotkeys? Where are they located on the keyboard? Right next to each other, right? <clears throat> um, all the softwares that are good, I think 3ds Max is somewhere else. Uh, so Maya and Cinema, they're in that top row. W or ERT, okay? Okay, so it's very easy to find as long as you keep your hand right there. <clears throat> now, this is moving and rotating and scaling that specific item. Let's say that we wanted to keep the item exactly where it's at, but look at the other side of that item, okay? So right now, we are physically, well, physically, we're virtually looking through a camera <clears throat> in Cinema 4D. We want to rotate this camera around to the other side. This is called orbiting inside the software. So if you hold down the Alt key on your keyboard, and then you click and drag left and right, you can see how you can spin around the item. Orbit. Yep. And again, these are on your hockey sheet too. <clears throat> Under camera manipulation, all left mouse button is orbit. Okay. So this is orbiting. Our, our item is centered, and we're kind of spinning around that item. <clears throat> the other thing we can do is if we use alt middle mouse button. This is called tracking, where we're just kind of like moving the scene around. We're not actually moving the scene. Our camera's moving. OK, so use Alt and Middle Mouse button to move the scene. And then we need to zoom in and out. So what do you think zooms is? Scroll wheel works, yes. 
Uh, the other one is Alt and right mouse button. Okay. Now you could definitely use the scroll wheel, <clears throat> uh, but what I don't like about it is that it clicks into position. So as I get here, it's kind of clicking. It's not smoothly going in. Not a huge deal. Let me go to a different spot. It's kind of weird. I'm going groin. Uh, there we go. <laughs> so I'm kind of clicking into this position. So if I use Alt and right mouse button, I can slowly go into it or smoothly go into it. That may not seem like, again, a huge deal, but when you have a, an item, sometimes that click goes from, let's say this is my drink, and my camera's way back here, and I want to zoom in. When I click, sometimes it goes like past it or it goes into it. And so using that, that gradual zoom or that right mouse button uh, lets you kind of smoothly go into it. Okay, so these things, move, rotate, scale, and those three hotkeys, you will use all the time inside this software, all the time. Um, in Photoshop, typically, you move something and scale it, sure, but then you're painting it, or you're clone stamping it, or you're adjusting the color, or you're moving around. Here, when you model something, you're doing this. You go here, zoom in, oops, it's too far there. I go here, and I grab this, and then I move it, and then I zoom in, and then I move this, and I spin around, and then I move this, and whatever. Okay, so you're constantly moving in and out, zooming, scaling, rotating, whatever else. <clears throat> okay, so just be comfortable with those. Um, typically, it's going to take you a couple weeks just to get that muscle memory in there. That's fine. If you want that to happen quicker, spend more time in the software. There's no way around it, okay? Um, cool. So those are our nuts and bolts of just how to move around that stuff. <clears throat> now, on the right side, this is uh, the object. So it's called figure. There's some buttons on the right <clears throat> of figure. Um, this one is for layer color, which we'll see. These are for visibility. This is for whether it's enabled. And then this area here will get confusing, um, but it's one of Cinema's strengths. Think of like if you had an effect done on fo in Photoshop or After Effects. <clears throat> you can't see all the effects that you have applied across the board. In Cinema, you can. All of those effects basically are lined up right across, the li right across this thing. So as I add a specific effect to this or, or a, a tag to it, all of them will be listed here, and then I can copy and paste stuff, which we'll see. Okay, so you might think like, wow, this is a lot of wasted space. I just want to maybe you know, scoot that over, but eventually you'll use some of that stuff. Uh, down here at the bottom, <clears throat> these are our attributes. So whatever item we have selected, this is the attributes for that item. Uh, right now, yours and mine look a bit different. Right now, mine are showing me the move tools attributes, because I'm I selected on the move tool. That was the last thing that I selected. If I go to the rotate tool, now I'm in the rotate settings. If I click on the figure, now I get the figure settings. Okay, so depending on what we have clicked, we can see the settings for that specific item there. So I'm going to delete my character because I want to bring up a different item. <clears throat> uh, a tube. There we go. All right. So this is a tube. <clears throat> you can see this has a lot more options, maybe than the cube that you created, or definitely than the character, the figure that I created. Uh, depending on what you select, different items, different options will be available. Um, all of these will control what that base shape looks like. When you create a circle in Illustrator, it's a circle. But you may want to create a circle that has 20 divisions or 10 divisions. You may want to create a circle that has <clears throat> a radius at the center of it, and how many divisions does that have? Okay, So all of these things are things we would use to customize what this is going to look like right at the start of it. Any of these things where you see the arrows, you can click and drag on those. Okay, You can click on them for sure, but you can also just click and drag. So just try it out. Click and drag. And then you can see how you can adjust any of those properties. If nothing happens, pick a different property. Maybe you just pick the bad one.
All right, so this is one of the important reasons of why we would do something like that. <clears throat> I took this tube shape, which was round initially, and by limiting how many divisions it has, I've gotten the shape of this to look a lot closer to this shape, okay? <clears throat> this is why we would do something like that, because this gets us closer to that point. If we had something that is more rounded, then obviously we would round it off more, okay? Um, now, notice on here, let me zoom in so we can see it. If I play with pretty much any of these items here, something changes, um, except for two of them. Cap segments, I see nothing happening. <clears throat> Height segments, I see nothing happening. If I go to rotation segments, something does change though, obviously, okay? Um, your uh, ability to edit a shape is only limited by how many points you have on that shape. Think about gradient mesh or a, a, a spline inside of Photoshop or Illustrator. You draw two points, those are the only points that you have. You can't edit anything in the middle if there's no points in the middle. Obviously handlebars, but ignore that for a second. Um, <clears throat> same thing here. We have as many points as we want to edit these shapes. I can't see those divisions or I can't see those points. So go under display and turn on the second option, which is um, garage shading lines. <clears throat> so under display, garage shading lines. And what you should see on here is now a wireframe on top of your object, okay? Now this wireframe is basically the resolution of that specific object. Um, if I wanted to um, grab any one of these points, I could grab those points and push them in or pull them out or do whatever I want because they exist now. If those points aren't there, then I can't do that, okay? Um, and now when I adjust my cap segments, hey, it's actually doing something. When I adjust my height segments, it's doing something, okay? One thing we don't want to do is ever try to work at a very high resolution piece of geometry to get something out of it. <clears throat> so if I'm going to make a desk, I'm not going to make a desk with a million divisions in it because it, you know, why not? I'm going to make a desk with as low amount of divisions as possible and then build up to a higher resolution um, division. When you modeled something, anything, uh, or res model greedy. This is typically how you would work. You would create something that's very low resolution and then you would make it very high resolution, okay? I wouldn't like add a million divisions and try to get this right away. That doesn't work. It'll be a disaster. I have to create very low resolutions, <clears throat> making sure that all these lines are flowing the way that they should be flowing around the character, um, around his eyes, around his mouth, where his nostrils are, his neck, all that. And then I can start adding more and more and more um, geometry to it to create something like that, okay? And you'll see this across the board for um, any kind of modeling that we are going to do. Uh, that's another one. That's that one. There you go. Same thing here. <clears throat> very low resolution and then very high resolution. Now in this case, what they're doing, <clears throat> they started with this low resolution one, they make the high resolution one, and then they're making textures to make the low resolution look high resolution. Okay? So you can see uh, it says 6,000 polygons. That's how many of those divisions there are. This one has 6,000 divisions. This one has 6 million divisions. This will be very slow to render and very slow to animate. But if I take all the detail from this one, make a texture of it, and put it back on here, then it's actually on that surface and it looks like it. Now the way they get away with that is because these lines aren't really there on this character. It's just the texture. It's just the coloring of it, okay? It's kind of like a movie when they, um, they would build up someone's like cheek and then like, darken it and like put a flap of skin you're like oh my god it looks like they're like missing a chunk of their skin it's kind of like that where it's just all texture it's all like painted on stuff or painted abs you've seen 300 right everyone has painted abs <laughs> it's like that they painted on all these wrinkles on top of that character okay that's beyond this class but just for trivia stuff um you know here's more stuff here's low res medium res high res again the more resolution you have the more detail you can put into it 
but we never jump right to that high resolution. We always build up to the high resolution, okay? <clears throat> all right, so there's that, cool. Um, all of these have little tabs too, so basic, coordinates, object, slice, and fong, okay? Depending on what item you have, you will have different options. A sphere does not have, um, uh, will not have all of these same options in here too. I think it has slice. Um, cylinder has different ones as well. I go to cylinder, it has a caps one, okay? As you get comfortable with 3D, one of your uh, things should be to go through and just like, I'm gonna make something and I'm just gonna like screw around and you'll make something, you'll try different shapes and see which shape is gonna work best, okay? And you'll figure all that stuff out as to like, oh, this one has this, this one has that. Um, some of these obviously you can check it on and then you can draw it. <clears throat> Anything that has a dot right here can be animated, okay? So you click the dot that sets a keyframe, you move your timeline, change it, sets another dot. Cool. All right. Uh, let's actually like animate something. If I don't animate every three hours, uh, I go into withdrawal, so. Um, let's create, <coughs> uh, just for now, just a cube. Okay, so delete the stuff that's in your scene and just make a cube. This is one of the things that cinema is known for, which is called MoGraph, okay? Um, and basically it allows us to take one object and duplicate it a billion times if we wanted to. So I'm gonna go under MoGraph here and I'm gonna go down to Cloner. Okay, so go to MoGraph and then go to Cloner. And what we should see is we should see um, inside of our object area, it says cloner cube. If you have seven cloners or 20 cubes, you can just delete the extra ones. You just need one cloner and one cube. Now, nothing happened. <clears throat> I had my object selected. I clicked cloner and it did nothing. In order for me to actually get the cloner to apply to that cube, I have to nest that cube underneath the cloner. What does nesting mean? Right, but like folders, right? So if you nest a folder inside of another folder, you're just basically like putting one folder inside of another one. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna grab the cube and just drop it onto Cloner and you can see the down arrow. And now it's nested inside of it. And so now it's actually working. It's cloning itself, okay? You also notice the color changed or should have changed. <clears throat> um, so now we have a cube that cube is now getting cloned. The default for the um, cube, or for the clone, is three times vertically, okay? So every time you clone something, it'll do that. If I click on the cloner, I'll get different options for it. Let me move my board out of the way. <clears throat> we can take any item and clone it. And this is one of, again, the strengths of cinema is that literally anything, if I had an animation, I could clone the animation and then that animation would be cloned um, and it's just amazing. Some softwares <coughs> um, do not do this uh, at all without extra plugins. Uh, so we're gonna go to mode where it says linear and we're gonna change this to grid array. Now open your eyes as you're going down that list and just kind of like read each one of those so that if you're like, hey, I can do this as a uh, radial or I can do this as an object, you know, you want to pay attention to the world around you, right? So grid array, uh, make sure you're under the object area, clicked on the cloner. Should take our object and clone it in this like three by three by three grid. Okay, so object, grid array. Yours isn't there yet. Is your object, your cube underneath the cloner? No, like drug underneath it where there's an arrow. No guesses? 27. Wait. 16, why do I have that? Yeah. 
No, they're, they're uh, sorry, they are three by three, but they're overlapping. <coughs> that threw me for a second. Yeah, we have three by three by three. So three times three is nine, times three is 27. It doesn't matter, it's just something to kind of pay attention to because if you were to accidentally type in 50, then it's not just multiplying it by 50, it's multiplying it by a huge number that's in there because it's gonna multiply it like 50 times. So right now we have <coughs> three cubes going this way, three that way, and three up and down, but they're all on top of each other. So we're gonna go over here to the size. Uh, actually, let's go here. Let's go up to the cube and change the cube's size. So click on the cube. <coughs> and if you just go to scale and you scale the cube down, you can get it so that there's actually like spacing between them. Okay, so I just clicked on the cube, I clicked on the scale, and then I just clicked and dragged on one of these things until it got smaller. Right. You must. My stuff might look bigger or smaller or whatever. So if I'm here, Obviously, this looks a lot different than if you're like way back here and you know, like that. Okay. Just again, something that you have to just consider like working in 3D is <laughs> can be tricky. Uh, cool. So, if I wanted to add more cubes to this grouping, where do you think I would do that at? Cloner, right? Because that's where they got created. So, if I click back on the cloner, <clears throat> here's the count for them. So, I can just click and add more if I want. And if I need more spacing at the very bottom, <clears throat> it says size right here. You can make the sizes bigger there. So if I decided I wanted to have a whole bunch going like uh, in the X direction, I can make the X really big and then add a whole bunch more that way. Okay. So as you build stuff, you have to be able to jump around with all of these different kinds of things that we're doing because you'll have a menu item here and then that's going to do this and a menu item here that's going to do that a menu item here it's going to do something else so just be aware that you sometimes just have to click around and find that right button okay um, so let's move this up <clears throat> so if we go to the move tool we can lift that whole cloner group up and i want to lift it above the ground here so it's not like anywhere near the ground. All right, so there's our bunches of cubes. <clears throat> now what I wanna do is I want to drop all the cubes and have them just like fall and like break apart. That's awesome stuff. Uh, so I'm going to uh, click on the cloner, <clears throat> go over to tags, which is right above it, here's tags. And I'm going to go down to the simulation tag and go to rigid body. Okay, so I clicked on the cloner. I go to tags, simulation tag, rigid body. Now what that does is it adds a uh, collision tag. Nope, not a collision tag. A rigid body tag to the cloner itself. <laughs> now what this means is that when I hit play, instead of me having to animate like here's where the start of the animation is, here's where the end of the animation is, when I hit play, Dynamics will actually animate it for me. Okay, So hit play at the bottom, and you should see the item fall. Cool. Now I'm going to stop it. Well, there's no stop button. It's weird. It's like a pause button. Whatever. Uh, and then hit the rewind button. Now, how do I get it to not just fall straight down through the ground? Yeah, so make something to actually collide with it, because right now it's just like floating in space, basically, okay? So I'm gonna go right here, this is the floor. <clears throat> if you click, just click that button right there, it'll make a floor. Okay, now what's neat about this is that even though it's only this big, it actually extends to infinity, okay? Uh, now, if we hit play, what happens? It goes through the floor, right? 
So we've told the one object to be dynamic, but we've never told the other item, I want you to hit the like collide, okay? So I'm gonna rewind my animation. I'm gonna go to floor, I'm gonna go to, take a guess, tags and then simulation and then what? No, Bridget was the first one, collider body, yep. Collider body and then hit play again. So the floor is a collider body, the cloner is a, um, a rigid body, and then we get this kind of animation. Now, just like with everything <clears throat> we do, there's always options to change how it's calculating things and how the uh, end result is going to turn out. So is that as expected as we thought would happen? Are we expecting to like break into pieces? Right, that's what I want, break into pieces. This is boring like this. Um, so let's tell it, because right now what's happening, the software is reading that cloner as one object. It's not reading it as a bunch of tiny objects put together, even though they're not touching. So I pause it, I rewind it, <clears throat> and if I click on the cloner, um, you'll see that I have a new tab in here, which is called Dynamics Body. Okay, once I added that Dynamics tag to it, Dynamic Body became an option. And what I'm going to do is go down to the inherit tag area and say apply tag to children. Oops, I'm sorry. And uh, individual elements, I will say all. Forgot to hit that one. So inherit tag, apply tag to children, individual elements, all. So let's say that you your camera's crazy, right? You're just way far away. I have no idea where any of my stuff is, right? If you click on any one of your items and you hit O, it'll reframe that specific item, okay? So it'll just jump you back to, there's my items all together again. Just the regular zooming stuff. All right, um, so that's pretty cool, right? <clears throat> it works. Um, now obviously for something like this, this is again, one of the benefits of cinema is just how fluid all of this stuff is working. Um, before this was a thing, before you were able to do this, if I wanted this type of simulation to happen, <clears throat> I would have to make one cube, duplicate it this many times, make them all dynamic, and then make the floor rigid and then have it fall and then say, yeah, that's cool. Here, at any point, we could go into the beginning of this, change how many of these we have, change the spacing on them, I could rotate it, and get basically different results for all of these kinds of things, okay? So it's just very fluid as to how their stuff works. All right, uh, also, let's say I don't want cubes for all of these. There's so many of these different shapes in here, I wanna add something different to this. So go up to your list here and pick not a crazy one like figure or landscape, uh, but anything else within the, that regular range. So like uh, cone or cylinder or sphere or tube. Uh, I'm gonna pick torus because it looks like a donut. And then I'm gonna scale it down so it's smaller. Okay, so I made a torus. Now instead of the cubes, I want the torus there. So how do I get the torus in place of the cubes? Yep, drag it to the cloner. Now notice what happened. <clears throat> it did, uh, every other one is now a torus. Oops. Why are you doing that? Oh, <clears throat> my trackpad. Uh, I need to make that a little bit smaller still. There we go, okay. Yep, and so I scaled it so obviously they're not colliding and then if I were to hit play, it all animates just like it, you know, it, just like it would uh, originally. There's nothing else I need to update, it's just all linked. And any changes I make to that cloner will then affect the dynamics, will then affect everything else. 
<clears throat> if I want to change how the cloner is assigning that randomness or that uh, pattern to it, I'm going to click on the cloner. That controls all of the stuff that has to do with the cloner. And under object for the cloner, I'm going to change where it says clones iterate. Okay? So I click the cloner, I clicked object in its little area. And instead of iterate, I'm just going to say random. And what that's going to do is instead of placing uh, this one, then this one, then this one, then that one, it's going to randomly place them. So now I get kind of like this weird shape. And then literally you could add any other shape you want into that mix and everything will just work together. I'll drop that in there, drop that into the cloner. So now I have those in. Make sure they're small enough. Drop the pyramid in. It's exploding because they're they're overlapping, right? So if you have two items like this, because that's what's happening, you say be dynamic. Well, it's going to try to avoid collisions, so they just explode. <clears throat> so you got to make them smaller or make the space bigger. On the cloner itself. So now what we should do is give these a little bit of color, because right now it's kind of boring seeing everything uh, the same color. So down here in the bottom, <clears throat> this area right here, this is where we create what are called materials. A material is basically a definition of what the item is supposed to be, what it's supposed to look like. So if I'm trying to make wood, I need to define properties of wood. If it's glass, I need to define properties of glass. If it's metal, I need to define properties of metal. In order for me to do that, obviously I need to understand what all of those things would mean, right? So just double click down in that area and you'll see a material uh, sphere gets created. Just right here, just double click. Not in the bar though, you have to be in this gray area. Cool. Um, if you double click, it creates a material you can see the material over here, and you can edit everything on that side. <clears throat> for the video, for the lecture, it's hard for you to see that. So I'm going to double click it again, and that puts it into a bigger window. Typically, I work with like this. I'll take this window because I have multiple screens. I'll slide this window over to one of my other screens and tweak it as I'm working. That way I can always have that kind of uh, up and ready to go. So um, let's say that we're going to do a... Um, Plastic material, we'll start off with plastic. So call this plastic blue. You can call it whatever color you want, but I'm gonna call mine plastic blue. Okay, so what color is plastic blue? Blue, right? You guys think I'm trying to trick you or something, you're always hesitant. <clears throat> so I'm gonna give it a blue color. Now this is where you could, um, obviously decide what color blue you want to use. Your, your design one class, your elements of design, your principles of design do not leave or stay at that door. They follow you into all the other classrooms, okay? So understanding, hey, if I'm going to pick blue, I need to make sure that all the other colors that I pick are kind of working together with this same color, right? Um, so just as a uh, side bit, um, Adobe has a website called Adobe Color. If you've had classes before, I'm sure at some point they would have shown you Adobe Color. <clears throat> Basically, if you're not good at picking color themes, you can go here and say Explore, and here's a bunch of different color themes that other people have created, and you can pick ones that work for you. Um, typically, if you have uh, white and black, or a uh, um, yeah, white and black, 
you can add those into any one of these and it'll still work with you. Just be aware that you want your stuff to read well. So if I were to choose like this one here and everything in my scene <coughs> with values of this color here, it's not gonna read very well because everything's gonna be kind of too blended together. So I may wanna grab like this dark one, maybe the bright one, and then just use white and black or you know, really light pink and really dark uh, or mid-tone of that to get it to work, okay? Um, so just be aware of that. Here today, right now, we're arbitrarily picking colors. You don't wanna do that on future things that you will ever show anyone else, okay? We'll jump back to that when we get to it. Um, if you've never used this before too, <clears throat> give me a minute to explain how this works. Hue, saturation, and value. Your hue is based off of a 360 degree color wheel. <clears throat> Red, yellow, green, blue, so on. Uh, the, the saturation is how uh, pure that color is, how much of that color is coming off or how uh, desaturated it is. Basically, it's gonna take you from the brightest blue that you have there to a desaturated blue, which is obviously a white, <clears throat> okay? And then value is just the darkness of that color. So is it like a super dark blue that's desaturated, okay? So I typically, in, in any software that I use, I use the HSV because it's a lot easier for me to move from one color to another color to another color and maintain a good color tonality with all the stuff that I use, okay? So I picked this blue right here. Um, <clears throat> so there's color, that's what that color means, okay? Uh, we don't need to worry about diffusion right now. Uh, what about luminance? How much brightness or how much luminance is on a uh, piece of plastic? Right, depends on the type. Let's pretend <clears throat> that we are in a completely dark room. How much of this blue are we gonna see? None, right. So in 3D, luminance is more of like a glowing kind of effect, like illumination. If I had buttons on a dial of my controller, that might glow and be illuminating, right? So in this case, this blue doesn't have any luminance. Uh, what about transparency? This is just plastic like on my bottle cap, okay? How much transparency is on my bottle cap? None, right? So there's no transparency. Anything that doesn't have anything at all, you just leave it unchecked, okay? And it's just, it's not there. When you're down here at the bottom, it doesn't show you those check boxes until you go to basic, then they're all down here. It's kind of weird how that one's set up, uh, but obviously for space saving. Uh, what about reflection? How much reflection is on this bottle cap? A little bit, right? <clears throat> so um, that highlight that's right here, that's my reflection. And what you need to do is you need to analyze that surface so you can figure out, um, is it a sharp reflection? Is it a diffused reflect, like a spread out reflection? What is it? So <clears throat> under reflection, we're gonna change something here. You'll notice that it says under reflection, it says type blend legacy. <clears throat> uh, anything that says legacy, <coughs> is typically meant for like older stuff. Like if you opened a file from 10 years ago and you still want it to open and work, then that's what, why that's there. I don't know why it's the default, but it is. Just go into the list and pick the first one, Beckman. We'll get more into what these mean later on, uh, but basically all they're doing is, is choosing how the reflections are calculated, okay? Um, so from reflectance, go to the type, and change it to Beckman. <clears throat> Inside here, you have a whole bunch of settings. We'll get more into what all of these mean or what more of them mean, um, but ideally it's just understanding what it's supposed to emulate. If I had something that's like polished uh, chrome, those settings are gonna have very little roughness and a whole lot of reflection. Right? So you can see there's chrome, that's what it is. And because we have that blue mixed in, we're getting that blue with the chrome uh, on top of each other. If I didn't want that, I could turn color off and now I have a pure chrome, right? <clears throat> if I want it to be more like, I don't have a lamp here, more like these lamps. <clears throat> the lamps that are here, um, they are still very reflective, but that reflection is spread out a bit more, right? It's not just like crystal clear, it's a bit fuzzier. So I may go in here and take the roughness up on this and you can see 
the uh, reflection is actually fuzzing the more I add to that roughness area, okay? And again, just like we would take that, that wood texture and drop it on the floor, if you were to analyze what the floor actually looks like in some areas, that roughness is not the same value, okay? So roughness does not like across the board be the same thing. Typically, it's like a little bit here, a lot here, a little bit here. Uh, think of like a street, uh, a regular street, like 12 mile, ignore the potholes, 12 mile, you're driving down the street, there's not very much reflection on the street itself. But let's say there's a puddle in the middle of the street. Now that puddle is very reflective, the street is not reflective, right? So we would have that kind of balance between those things, okay? So for now, I'm just gonna take this reflection, um, I think to about like 17, and the roughness I'm gonna pull up <clears throat> maybe 75, okay? These are rough numbers. Don't be locked into, he typed in 17 and 75, I have to type in those two numbers. You're going to have to tweak things as you go. Where we have our lighting is going to make our stuff change how we look at stuff. Okay, so under reflectance, I change this to Beckman, I change the roughness to 75, I change my reflection strength <coughs> to 19. Um... I think I want to take that specular strength down to like three also. I think it might be just too, a bit too strong, okay? <clears throat> we see two previews, this colored one in the top left. That's what the object's going to look like. This one is just a previewing just reflection. So this is just what the reflection looks like. This is a combination of all of the effects added on top of it, okay? Uh, we don't have to worry about environment or fog right now. <clears throat> uh, bump map is for the bumpiness of it. Look at that wood floor. Uh, is it a polished wood? Probably not very much bump to it. Is it a parquet floor? Probably a lot of bumps on it, right? Uh, or is it a, a plank floor, like a, a, a two by four or something? A lot of bumps, so we would add that to it. In this case, for today, I'm not gonna get into the bump map. We'll leave that alone for now. <clears throat> Normal is similar to bump. Alpha is transparency, glow is glow, and displacement is actually like bump but different okay so just color and reflectance are the only two that we're really going to play with uh today i mean um, maybe we'll do one as transparency all right that's fine okay so we can close that now i want to take this material and i want to tell it that one of my objects let's say a cube my cube is going to be transparent <clears throat> so all i do is i drag this plastic onto my cube over here and now that cube has that plastic assigned to it. <clears throat> okay. Now let's say that I wanted to create another material that looks exactly the same thing except a different color. I could make a new material, um, punch in all the same settings I have, or I could copy and paste this. What's easier? Uh, I don't know, does that work? Yeah, it does. <laughs> It does work. Yeah, you can click on it. Uh, typically, I just control drag. <clears throat> if you control drag in here, it'll just copy it. Okay, so I'm going to copy it four times. And each one of these, I'm just going to give a different color name to. So let's say this one's red. And I'll go under color and I'll choose red. And I'll go to the next one. So sometimes you'll drag your materials to an item and it just doesn't update. It's not showing you it's there. It's assigned to it, but it's just not updating. Uh, any 3D software is very reliant on the video card itself in the computer to show you what it's doing. Sometimes video cards aren't uh, always reliable, okay? So let's see what this is actually gonna look like when we render this out. So if you hit Shift and then R, that will open up what's called the picture viewer. And you can use your same um, zooming in and out tools to see what that looks like. 
okay? So this is doing what's called a rendering. It takes all the information that's in the scene <clears throat> and it's actually outputting like this is what it looks like so far. When we look at something in here, it might look shiny, but it's actually not updating any of the reflections, okay? It doesn't calculate reflections while we're in the viewport. When we do this, this is actually calculating reflections, okay? Now just to show you that, you don't do this part, I'll just do this part. I'm just gonna make a material that is super reflective. What? There we go. And you can see some reflection here, but it's not reflecting any of the cubes and cylinders and whatever else. When I come into this view and I render it, this is where it's actually gonna go through and calculate all those other things reflecting into that. Now you'll see a huge difference in this to that. What is the big difference? Mm -hmm. So inside here, it's using this default image. It has basically just like this fake 360 degree image it's using for the reflections. When we do our render, <clears throat> it's actually reflecting whatever's actually in the scene. So way above it, what do we have? Nothing, so it reflects black, so that's what we're seeing. But you can see on here, all of that other stuff is still reflecting right inside the sphere, okay? So what we see inside of this area is always gonna be preview to what actually renders out, and so we just have to be aware of that. And sometimes, like in your case, the colors aren't showing up, but when we hit Shift R, we get to see all of those uh, items in there. Now, uh, on the right side, I've done three renders so far. You'll notice that it's saving each one of these renders. <clears throat> this is a, one of the, the things I love about cinema is that it's, it does that for you automatically. Um, and I can basically go through this and see all of my past renders. The reason we would do that is so we could look at, <clears throat> this is what I did, and then I did this, and then I did this, and then I did that. And as I make changes to my materials, to lighting, to cameras, whatever, I can see all those changes progressing. And if I, I, let's say, take a step backwards, um, I could always say, okay, well, it looked better at step four, so I'm gonna undo and get back to step four, whatever it is, okay? So in here, you'll see um, we do have a ground. It's this gray color. We have our items here. Uh, what's missing from the picture, though? Well, the sphere, that's gone. <clears throat> if this was a real world and I had items laying on the ground, Shadows, right? So we should see shadows. Why don't we have shadows? There's no light, right? So we have to tell the software we want to add light, and on that light, we want to add shadows, okay? So on the uh, light button right here, I'm not going to go into everything. You can close your render view. We'll bring that up in a minute. You click and hold, <clears throat> and we can use a, um, we'll just use a regular light for this one, just regular light light. Okay. And then I need to move that light above my scene. Lights work in 3D very much like they work in the real world. If my light is underneath all my stuff, I don't get to see all my stuff because it's under it. So I need to make sure my light is obviously in an area that I can see my stuff working. So just take your light and you move it to an area where it's above your stuff. <coughs> In our attributes on the side, <clears throat> notice all the different things that we have for lights. <clears throat> That's one of the, uh, probably the most optioned tool that we have. There's so many different things that you can do with lights. Um, any photographers in the room? Okay, people taking. Uh, if you take a picture of the sun, what, is, what typically happens? It's overexposed, but let's say um, you set it up correctly so it's not overexposed, but the sun is like crazy bright what was the effect that you would get in your camera? Around lens flare, right? So you typically get a lens flare. So that's stuff that in 3D, we don't automatically get a lens flare. We can fake it by punching in some of those options, okay? <clears throat> um, same thing with um, uh, caustics. If I shine a light on a blue glass, what, what happens to the light after it goes through the blue glass? blue, right? So on the table, you would see like a blue 
light that, that it shines through. That stuff is not on by default. We have to turn all that stuff on, okay? The more stuff we add to our scene like that, the slower our render times are gonna be. Um, so we kind of step into things that we need as we go. Caustics is not something, that's what it's called. We wouldn't add caustics to every single scene. We wouldn't add lens flares to every scene. We kind of add them as we need them, okay? So I'm gonna go under shadows. <clears throat> And under shadow, I'm just going to set this to uh, shadow map soft. And then under shadow map, which is down here, it says 250 by 250. I'm going to set that to 1,000. <clears throat> now, what that's doing is the shadow has its own resolution. That's setting it to a higher resolution than 250. Um, at 250, it might have been it was just a bit too fuzzy for me. So hit shift R again. Now, if you use your arrow keys on your keyboard up and down, you can get the before and after. Huge improvement, right? Just adding a light, clicking on some shadows, it, it makes it feel a bit more realistic. <clears throat> one of our goals in, in 3D, or one of our challenges, um, is always to get what we are after. When they do, um, when they did Finding Nemo, they said, okay, we want you to make these underwater scenes. And they, they did some tests and trials and tweaked things out. And they came back and their stuff was actually too photorealistic. And then they had to dial it back some, okay? When they did um, uh, Final Fantasy, when that movie came out years ago, that was their goal. Like, we want people to look like people. And at the time they did, it was like, holy cow, that looks like a, a real person, but it was all CG. So all the stuff that we do here, we're always trying to get it to that level of where our end goal is. Sometimes it's going to be photorealistic, sometimes it's going to be more stylized, um, but in most cases um, you have some sort of end goal you're going for and getting there is always the tricky part, okay? That's always kind of pushing the software to get to where you want it to be. <clears throat> so in this case it actually looks pretty good. Um, there's more stuff obviously we could do to this. Uh, what do we notice about it just as, you know, the lighting? How does the lighting look? It is pretty harsh. Well, what are we missing? Where there's no light back here, we see nothing, right? In the real world, if I shined a light on a box, what would happen to the side that's not lit up? Right, a little bounce light, right? It hits the ground, the light bounces back. Again, something we don't get by default in the software, we'd have to turn that on, okay? Now, just to show you, <clears throat> we have six seconds, six seconds, seven seconds. That's how long each one of my renders took. <clears throat> Let's turn that on and just see what the difference is, okay? So we can close our picture viewer. This little clapper, like one of those movie clappers with the gear, click on that. It's like right in the middle of your bar. These are our render settings. <clears throat> one of the benefits of working in 3D is we don't have to really worry too much about resolution until we get to that end point where we're like, okay, well now that we have a, a car that we built, do we want it on a phone app or do we want this to be like IMAX size? And at any point we could just change that size and get the same results, or we obviously the appropriate result. Um, so we're gonna go under where it says standard <clears throat> and choose physical. And then under effect at the bottom, bottom-ish, we're going to choose uh, global illumination. Okay, so at the very top we chose physical from the renderer. <clears throat> it said standard right here. We changed that to physical. And then down here under effect, we added global illumination. Physical is just a different rendering engine. Every rendering software has a default engine that comes with it that does all the calculation. <clears throat> Um, Cinema has standard in this physical one. There's also other ones like Octane and RenderMan and whatever else that are all um, not in here by default, but out there that you could get, okay? Um, Pixar created a software called RenderMan. That's typically what they use. Sony has their proprietary rendering software. Disney has their proprietary rendering software. 
Um, the concepts are the same across the board. It's just a matter of getting out what you want as fast as you can. Cool. So we just changed those two things. Let's close that. <clears throat> and then what's the hotkey for rendering it? Shift R. Shift -R. So far, longer than seven seconds. <laughs> Think about the light that we have in the scene. <clears throat> it has to shine for each object that's in there, figure out what objects are in the way, figure out where the shadows are, figure out where the object's hitting the other ones, figure out where the bouncing's coming from, and doing all that for all the objects in the scene. The bigger scene we have, the more stuff we have going on, the longer that's going to take. Now, even though this is um, a simple scene, you can see already how long this rendering process is taking. It's just now getting to the part where it's actually rendering it out. Now, guaranteed, <clears throat> this is going to look a lot better than it did here or here, but it's obviously at a cost. And that's where, it's, uh, where 3D um, loses people because of how long it takes to render stuff. Now, my workflow typically is... If I'm going to go to bed, <clears throat> I have an animation, I'll set this up, and in the morning I'll check it out and see where it's at. If I'm going to go out for the day, I'll set something up to render and let it go. If I'm in class on Friday and there's a lab or whatever, I'll set up my stuff in here, leave it for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, come in on Monday and check it out. Okay? Anytime we render something, <clears throat> if you render on the computers, we have these signs here, which are rendering signs. You leave your computer up. You put a rendering sign on the keyboard, and then people know, or should know, not to turn off the computer, okay? Um, and then people are typically pretty good about it. <clears throat> if somebody comes in um, and they, I, I teach all day Monday, Wednesday. So if somebody comes in, they say, hey, there's a rendering sign, my computer's going really slow and they can't move, we'll shut your stuff down, they'll work, and then after they leave, I'll start it back up again, okay? So I try to make sure that, you know, your stuff is covered during the day. Tuesday, though, I'm not here. Friday, I'm not here. So you need to make sure that you come in and check your stuff if you're rendering it out uh, or obviously render at home. So that looks, <coughs> just by the before and after, you can see how much detail that kind of adds right to that little bit of it, right? Especially like right there, you can see some of that green glowing. The colors are melting together a bit better than they did before. Uh, this took two and a half minutes <clears throat> versus seven seconds. All of these things that we do, you have to think again about what that end result is supposed to look like. Um, there's so many different styles that are out there. Right, so something like this versus something like that <clears throat> uh, versus something like this. same one all right so all of these you you basically have to have an idea of what you want stuff to look like there's that caustics right you can see that light coming through even on the reflection here you can see the caustic ring here's glass <clears throat> this will add another level of complexity to things because you have the reflection on the outside of the glass but then you also have the refraction of how the glass is like bending the light on the inside and distorting the stuff behind it now, if this was an animation, go back to 120 frames, right? Calculator, I have 120 frames, and each frame took about two and a half seconds, or two and a half minutes. So that's 300 minutes is how long that would take. How long is that? Five hours. Yep. Divided by 60 is five hours. So for 120 seconds, <clears throat> or 120 frames, five hours to render. Now that's also not including, probably should have motion blur on there because that would be nice because as these things fall, they shouldn't be falling crystal clear. They should have a trail of motion blur behind them. Now let's say that uh, in photography, uh, what's a cool effect that you can do so that the background is blurry? Depth of field, right? <clears throat> so if you had depth of field, that's another thing that adds on top of it. So 
it's something that we have to be aware of and we have to kind of direct our stuff so that it gets to that realm. And sometimes you will find something that literally takes a day or a weekend or a week to render out your stuff. In this class, nothing in here should take a week to render out, okay? Typically, the most stuff, when we get to some of our stills, they might take an hour. For the animation, it might take three hours for the animation, but nothing for like that. You get the higher classes, sure. But you don't get glass like that unless you have you know, cool stuff. Uh, like this here, right? Obviously, it's not photorealistic. It's a very stylized look to it, <clears throat> but it's very cool. Same thing there. You get some cool looking things. Okay. Um, I do recommend too. Uh, I didn't mention them, but uh, on Facebook, there's a couple groups. Um, I always go off screen in case you know somebody shared something inappropriate. Ten thousand hours. There we go. So there's a group called Ten Thousand Hours, <clears throat> and the idea is that. Um, you have all this work that you do, especially for any, anyone. Like you've, you've sketched something out and thrown it in your drawer at some point. You've opened Photoshop and done something and half finished it and threw it in there. So it's, it's a way for people to kind of share stuff that they're working on or old projects or whatever. <clears throat> um, so here is made with Blender, rendered in EV, one HDR setup. There's another one. But what's cool about this is you get, obviously, different styles of animations, different styles of models, different styles of rendering. The more you have in your mental uh, library, the more you can kind of pull from as you're working on things. <laughs> right? Like, that's pretty awesome right there. Right. Rigging and animation. And then they'll do things like this, where it's just a test. Like, I wanted to test out uh, fibers and something ripping in 3D, so I did this. You know, it's nothing for a portfolio, but it's just something uh, cool to show off because it gets people interested in what they're doing. That's cool. So that's a rig. So if you were to animate a character, let's say, a bunch of characters you can pull from, apparently. Uh, <laughs> dog. There's also a group called Sculpt January, <clears throat> and kind of like Inktober, uh, but they sculpt something every day in January. And it's a um, uh, clay sculpting, people that clay sculpt, and people that 3D sculpt. So it's just kind of like a fun uh, thing to do. But again, you get different styles of people doing these sculpts. So here is, obviously, this guy's sculpt there. <clears throat> this one there. Whatever that is. Oh, it's fuel gauge. <laughs> And these are all one-day sculpts. So some of these are like, I spent four hours doing this, or I spent two hours, or however long people take to do them. But again, it just adds to your library of things that you can do. <laughs> Let me see photos. There we go. And so they give you a prompt list at the beginning of the month, and then you just do, like, day one is this, day two is that. It's pretty awesome. So I recommend doing anything like that where you can just, again, just add to that mental library of styles and animation skills and all this stuff. Cool. Um, all right. So we added a light, we added a floor, <clears throat> we have our cloner, we have the objects there. Um, let's go set up our animation to actually render out an animation, okay? Um, and that'll be the last thing we'll do for today and then we'll save it. So go back to that gear with the little clapper and we're gonna turn off that stuff that we just turned on. So I'm just going to uncheck the global illumination and then set my renderer back to standard. Okay, so uncheck global illumination because we don't want that because it's too long to render, and then we went back to standard so that we get uh, back to the default mode. So we're going to start at the top and we're going to work our way down. <clears throat> On your cheat sheets, there was a resolution for animations. What was the resolution? Yep, 
So that's what you type in there, 960 pixels by 540 pixels. And that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Okay, uh, go ahead. Under output, sorry. Uh, and then 960 by 540, that's our resolution for animation. Uh, our frame range, how many frames should we render out? All of them, right? So our frame rate is 30, meaning 30 per second, but we need to render out all the frames in a bunch so that we get the whole animation, okay? Um, so we set that to all frames. <clears throat> Under save, we're gonna click the dots and we're gonna find our folder on the P drive. Should be under playing and it should be under renders. So I click the dots, found my folder on the P drive, playing, renders, and then I'm just gonna give this a name, uh, playing, re playing, renders. That's fine. Okay, so under output, we just set the resolution 960 by 540, told it to do all the frames. Under save, we went to file and we told it to uh, save it into our renders folder. If we don't tell it where to go, um, it'll either render it to like some random spot on someone's other, someone else's folder, or it'll just put it wherever it feels like it or not render at all. Uh, then we're gonna go down to the name area. Okay, so in, under that same tab, <clears throat> it says name. And it says, uh, from the drop-down list, there's a bunch of different ways that it can name our stuff. <clears throat> because we're not dealing with one file, we're dealing with uh, 90 files in this case, we want to name them as name.number.extension. So we're going to scroll all the way down to name.number.extension. Okay, and what that's going to do is for frame 50, it's going to call it playing renders dot 50 dot tiff. That way After Effects will know this is frame 50, okay? Um, so we named it, we told it to be this one, um, and that should be good enough. <clears throat> There's other settings we'll get into, but for today it's, it's fine. It's not gonna be the cleanest quality, but it'll be good enough. Okay, so we close. We save, because we haven't saved at all. I haven't saved at least. So I'm gonna save that into my scenes folder. And I always typically put my last name as the file name, Sarcona underscore playing underscore zero zero one or two or three or whatever it is. Right. And once you have <clears throat> your file saved, once you have your render settings set up, you just hit Shift R again. And then on your P drive, you have that folder. That's the folder you want to back up every single day. So when you come in here, <clears throat> you make sure that that folder is there. Uh, and when you leave, whatever changes you've done, you back that up. So whether it's the Dropbox or your thumb drive or whatever, that's what you need to make sure that you have all backed up. Okay, so before you leave today, do that. Uh, for homework for Wednesday, I want you to start sketching out um, different ideas for things to put inside of a room. Our first project to go through the entire thing of modeling and texturing and blah, 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 uh, will be a uh, desk and some other items in the room. So I want you to start sketching out different things that you would include in your room. So it might be like you literally just go to Google and you type in um, desk. You go to images, you find a cool desk that you like, and you sketch that out what it would look like. Okay, when you turn in your stuff in the very end, 
<clears throat> you will have that specific item. I would also download any items or any uh, images that you, you see like, hey, I like the way this is set up. I like the colors, I like the shape of it, whatever it is. Uh, something like that, right? So I'm like, cool, I like this thing. Download the image, put it in your references folder, sketch out what you want yours to look like, all right? And have a couple images so when you come in, you're not going from like a, a blank space. We're gonna do some things together, but then you'll have some freedom to kind of make your own stuff, okay? Questions on that? No? All right, then I will uh, let you go and I will see you on Wednesday.